The late 1960s were a golden age for cults in America, and their rise in popularity hasn't stopped. Many of the names and faces are part of mainstream lore and infamy, but some of them have escaped the notoriety they deserve. Terry Hoffman's conscious development is one of them. In the early 1970s, Terry Lee Hoffman taught unaccredited meditation courses at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. The courses were a blend of metaphysical and Eastern philosophies. By 1974, she had established a cult following and was seen as a visionary leader, protector, and healer. She sold her writings and charged people for one-on-one -on -one spiritual cleansing consultations. Guided by the writings of Edgar Cayce, the study of silver mind control, meditation, and hypnotism, she claimed she could communicate with the dead and see the past and the future. Soon after, she expanded her conscious development movement by starting a jewelry business, incorporating it as CD Gems. She sold expensive handmade jewelry, rings, necklaces, and bracelets, and said the pieces would become powerful protective gems after she electrically charged them and that they would remove negative energies allowing the wearer to ascend as she had. She claimed the more jewelry you wore, the more protected you were from the dark forces of the universe. The more expensive the piece, the greater the power it held. She told her followers it wasn't just her earthly studies that allowed her to harness such power. It was because she had been given instruction and wisdom directly from God. He chose her as his emissary to save people from what she called the Black Lords and Black Overlords, and she fought by his side on several planes of existence as the reincarnation of St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa was a Catholic mystic who believed she saw a vision of the human soul. It was a diamond in the shape of a castle containing seven mansions, which she interpreted as a journey of faith through seven stages, ending with a union with God. For her followers to gain enough power to join her in the fight, they needed to be part of her inner circle, which she called the Teacher's Group. Members were handpicked based on their devotion to the mission. She chose 25 teachers, creating a tiered system of enlightenment, allowing her to isolate herself from the uninitiated so she could focus on helping God defeat the dark forces by sending them to the pits of hell and into the electromagnetic dissolving cave. The teachers were told they needed certain items to fight against the Black Lords. A rod, a sword, a cup, and a bag of dirt, symbolizing fire, water, air, and earth. Wearing a robe and her protective jewelry would provide even greater protection. When Terry would get sick, she would claim it was the Black Lords fighting back and that she was absorbing the punishment to protect everyone else. She said the Lords could poison people's blood. That drove many people out of the group and was a sign of things to come. Terry wasn't just taking advantage of people by selling them overpriced jewelry. It was far more sinister than that. After divorcing her first husband, John Wilder, in 1971, she was committed to Parkland Hospital for psychiatric treatment. Later that same year, she married a 20-year-old member of the group and one of her former students at Southern Methodist, Glenn Scott Cooley. Five years later, Cooley left the group and ended his marriage to Hoffman. Five days after the divorce was finalized, he was found dead in his parents' cabin. Toxicology reports showed he overdosed on Valium and Librium. Hoffman had his will in a safe in her house, and she was listed as the sole beneficiary. It read, I, Glenn Cooley, give to Terry Cooley all of my property, both personal and real. This includes two boats, a 1972 Buick Limited, all jewelry and equipment for its making, all furnishings for the house on Dunhaven Road, and all cash. I ask that this last will of mine not be contested by anyone in any way for any reason. In 1989, 13 years after his death, a former member of Hoffman's inner circle told a police investigator that she and Hoffman were at the cabin the night of his death, but that he had already consumed the fatal dose when they arrived. Hoffman told her that he was moving to the next level. On February 25, 1979, two years after Glenn's death, the 14-year-old daughter of one of Terry's most faithful followers drowned in a boating accident. Devereaux Cleaver, her mother Sandy, and her fiancé were on vacation in Hawaii when a wave knocked them out of their inflatable raft and Devereaux drowned. Firefighters rescued Sandy, but Devereaux's body wasn't found until hours later. Before she was found, a member of Conscious Development called her father, Chuck, and informed him that they had witnessed his daughter write a will leaving all of her possessions, including a $125,000 trust fund, to Terry. 
Luckily, Texas law precluded minors from writing wills, so it was declared invalid. When Chuck visited Sandy in the hospital, he said that she was crying and upset until Terry entered the room. Her demeanor changed immediately, and she said to Terry, Devereaux will be happier in heaven. He also revealed that Sandy had been feeding her pills for years, pills that she had gotten from Hoffman. Less than two years later, on September 9, 1981, Sandy and her housekeeper, Louise Watson, were driving through the Colorado mountains to visit Terry and her new husband, Don. Sandy's car was found the next day at the bottom of a 450-foot cliff, and both women were pronounced dead at the scene. There were no tire marks on the road or witnesses to the accident. In June, just four months earlier, Sandy wrote a will that left everything to Terry. Later the same day, Louise wrote a will naming Sandy as the executrix of her estate and Terry as the alternate. Terry identified the bodies two days after the accident and immediately cashed Sandy's $300,000 life insurance policy. Sandy's brother contested the will, claiming his sister was controlled by Hoffman's use of hypnosis, Pavlovian conditioning, and psychotherapy. After five days in court, Terry agreed to pay $112,000 and surrender 40% of the proceeds from the sale of Sandy's house. Former school counselor Robin Ottstadt quickly filled Sandy's role in the group, and things got even more bizarre. In 1986, Robin was having an affair with a CIA agent named George Jeffrey. She kept a journal where she wrote about their romantic dinners, intimate conversations, and details of the trips they took together. The issue was that George only existed in Robin's mind. She called him a supernatural patriot and claimed Terry was training him and using her powers to keep him safe so she could protect America. In April of 1987, Robin told her husband that she had contracted a terminal case of hepatitis from a banana peel. Though he was very confused about why she would say such a thing, he scheduled her a doctor's appointment. After leaving the doctor's office, Robin visited Terry and returned home. Later that night, she took her own life with a 38 caliber revolver. Her blood test results confirmed that she didn't have hepatitis or any other disease. Two months earlier, she wrote a will leaving all of her money and possessions to Terry Hoffman. Seven months later, on November 30th, a woman was found deceased in a Chicago motel room. Police found a pack of cigarettes, a pen, a blank notepad, a glass of Sprite, and nearly 100 pills. The cause of death was ruled to be an overdose, and the coroner found a small puncture mark on her left wrist. The woman was Mary Levinson, a member of Conscious Development. She left a video for her family explaining that she spent her $125,000 divorce settlement to pay debts and contribute to charities that she stated, I will not name because it was her money to do with as she pleased. She added that she believed in euthanasia for those who are suffering. She changed the beneficiary on her life insurance policy to Dr. Larry Keyes, a member of Conscious Development whom she met at a retreat with Terry Hoffman. Mary's mother's credit cards were billed for over $3,000 worth of jewelry over the previous couple of months. Her family was convinced Keyes' name was listed on the policy so that Terry would be a step removed and the policy couldn't be contested. Less than a month later, English professor Charles Southern Jr. was found wandering the streets of Chicago by his sister. He was speaking a strange language and repeating himself over and over. She took him to a local hospital to be examined and he was kept for treatment. During his stay, he was visited by members of Conscious Development. Charles was quickly climbing the ranks in the organization and taught classes and spent time at Hoffman's home in Texas. After his recovery, he told his family that he wanted to distance himself from the group, and he booked a trip to India to get away. When no one heard from him after he supposedly returned from his trip, his parents drove to his apartment in Chicago to check up on him. When they arrived, the apartment was locked, so they broke in. They found his passport, which had no stamp, suggesting he never went to India, there was an empty drug vial, and his hat and coat were folded inside out on a stool in a ceremonial display. They found out later that it represented a Nigerian tribal symbol of death. There were two scribbled notes in his apartment, and though they were barely legible, one part was easily read, the naming of Terry Hoffman as the executor of his estate. Charles Southern Jr. has never been found. 
Authorities haven't officially named Hoffman or any member of the Conscious Development Group as a person of interest. On September 16, 1988, a man was found dead in his room at the Marriott Hotel in Las Colinas, Texas. An autopsy confirmed the man died from a drug overdose. He was 50-year-old Don Hoffman, Terry's fourth husband. He left a three-page note and videotape message for his family explaining that he was diagnosed with terminal, inoperable cancer and wasn't interested in chemotherapy, saying it would only prolong his suffering. Like the others, he left all of his property to Terry. His children filed a wrongful death lawsuit against her, claiming she used mind control techniques, hypnosis, and behavior modification to persuade Don to end his life. Their attorney, James Barklow, decided to do some investigating and inspected Hoffman's trash. He found dozens of needles, syringes, empty pill bottles, and cotton swabs. He also found a note thanking Terry for her bulk purchase of the drugs. When Terry was told that Don's autopsy proved that he didn't have cancer, she disagreed. She claimed that a spiritual being told her that the Black Lords were hiding the cancer from the medical examiner so they could continue to hurt members of the group. Two weeks after Don was found in the hotel, longtime Conscious Development member Jill Bounds was found beaten to death in her home. Jill joined the group in 1973 and by 1979 was a close friend of Terry's, but she left the group in 1982 after the strange deaths of people associated with Terry. She visited her multiple times during the previous months for psychic readings. An ex-boyfriend involved with conscious development had the alarm code to Jill's security system and later told her sister that he was listed as the beneficiary of her insurance policy. His name actually wasn't mentioned in her will, and everything was left to her family. Her murder is still unsolved. David Goodman was a university professor who married his wife, Glenda, in 1984. Glenda was deeply entrenched in the conscious development cult and had received Terry's blessing to marry David. The happily married couple quickly distanced themselves from their families and focused on their roles as part of the group's inner circle. Glenda sent her children to live with their father as David considered them a distraction from their work. The Goodmans gifted Terry a 1988 Lincoln Continental, a two-bedroom house, and over $100,000 between 1987 and 88 as part of their pledge to give her 50% of everything they acquired for the rest of their lives. In January 1990, Glenda and David were found dead in their Lake Highlands home. They were shot to death in what police claimed was a double suicide. They had been dead for over a month before they were found. The Dallas County District Attorney's Office investigated the deaths and focused on Hoffman. After interviewing many of her followers, Prosecutor Cecil Emerson said he believed she possessed hypnotic powers, but that didn't equate to evidence to bring to a grand jury. In October 1991, Terry filed for bankruptcy to protect her from the multiple civil suits that were filed against her. Soon after, she was indicted on counts of bankruptcy fraud for allegedly hiding assets, and in 1994, she was convicted on 10 counts of fraud and faced 50 years in prison. She appealed the conviction in May 1995, arguing that she didn't lie about her assets in her bankruptcy filing. She just may have forgotten to include some, and the court believed her. The conviction was overturned, the case was dismissed, and she was free to go. Terry died on October 31st, 2015, leaving a trail of darkness and unanswered questions in her wake. We'll likely never know the true scope of the damage she caused and the lives she destroyed.